Peter Hunt was barely 17 when news reached him of his Aunt Kate's death in a North London hospital. And knowing that she was almost penniless, he entertained no expectation of benefits as her only surviving relative. It was with some surprise, therefore, that he read in the matron's letter of the dispatch of a small, locked box, recently brought from a safe deposit to her bedside, to which she had evidently attached great importance. By the same post, there also arrived a package from his aunt herself, addressed in the weak, spidery calligraphy of extreme age, enclosing a key and a brief note which read, To my nephew Peter Hunt, open the box and make what use fate wills of its contents. The box arrived by delivery van in the evening of the same day, and was carried upstairs by Peter himself to his mean back bedroom in a Tilbury lodging house. It was not very heavy, and any hope of hoarded coin vanished as soon as he lifted it, though there remained, of course, the slender chance of banknotes or bearer bombs. He cut the cords with which its lock had been reinforced, and, taking the key from his pocket, opened it. It contained three objects only. A small-scale model of a stone fortress, mounted on a pedestal shaped to resemble a rocky hill, a folded sheet of paper, and something which looked like a silver-framed magnifying glass, except that its lens was opaque, almost black, in fact, and nearly impervious to light. Peter drew the miniature towards him. It was no more than three inches high, and examined it as closely as the poor light from the dirty window would allow. It was too early to use the gas. The meter was always ravenous for his pennies. Even to his untutored eyes, the workmanship of the model was exquisite the degree of finish seeming to represent a lifetime's labour. Every single stone block, and there were thousands, in the structure of the building had been faithfully reproduced, and even such details as patches of lichen had not been overlooked. With luck the thing would be worth several pounds as a curiosity. Perhaps he would have it valued by Christie's. It wouldn't do to trust Uncle Abe at the corner shop. He pushed it aside and reached for the folded paper. Recognising his father's characteristic handwriting as he smoothed it out, it related to the contents of the box and read as follows. I, Vernon John Hunt, having been given by the doctors three months to live, have determined to put in writing what is known of lost keep, of which this scale model has been handed down from parent to child for many generations. Tradition has it that the miniature was made under pain of death by an Italian craftsman, condemned by an early ancestor to imprisonment in the original stronghold until such time as he could complete the task. That he did complete it, the miniature itself testifies, but history does not relate whether his release followed or whether, with the callousness of feudal days, he was left to rot in his prison. There is, I regret to say, some ground for the latter supposition, for he is credited in the Latin manuscript now destroyed, with having laid some kind of curse on this piece of craftsmanship. A peculiarity of the whole matter is that there have been so many female heirs that the name of the original title holders is forgotten, the heirloom having passed haphazard from male to female issue and so transferred itself to various different families. Even the locality of the original site is unrecorded. Hence its name of Lost Keep, and the curse of the modeler is concerned with this fact. The old fortress, if it still stands, may be in Iceland, Scandinavia, Russia, or for that matter any part of the world, but translating from the Latin script it is supposed to be rediscoverable by anyone who has the wit or fortune to combine glass and facsimile with understanding. Whoever solves the riddle, however, is threatened with greater temptations of the devil than have beset any other of Adam's descendants, and, if he succumbs, will find death in the home of his fathers at the hand of his son. Doubtless each successive holder of the heirloom has attacked the problem, though there is no rumoured instance of its solution. I, in my turn, have wasted hours in speculation as to the purpose of the dark glass shaped so like a lens, yet so obviously useless as such, and have examined every point of the model's surface with a normal reading glass for signs of engraved lettering, but have learned no more than to marvel at the delicacy of the work. On the latter count, the model would probably be of considerable value among collectors, but its secret 
if it really possesses one, is well hidden. So, being under sentence of death, I entrust this sole heirloom of a family whose fortunes are at ebb to my sister Kate, requesting her to hold it for my son Peter until her death or his majority. The document was neither dated nor signed. Peter leaned back and looked with a distaste that familiarity had never conquered round the shabby room. So his father had believed the model to be of value too. So much the better. He'd have no false sentiment about parting with it, since he'd never even heard of it till today, and he'd certainly get it valued at an early opportunity. It ought to fetch enough to pay for a course of night classes at a technical school, or, with great luck, a real college career for which he could drop his present uncongenial job as warehouse packer, and fit himself to enter those higher spheres that his hereditary instinct craved. Meanwhile, his day's work was finished, and he could not afford to go out looking for amusement. He might as well have a shot at the dark glass problem. Picking the apparently useless thing up, he studied it closely. It certainly looked like a lens, being a circle of some vitreous composition thick at the centre, thin at the sides, and mounted in a metal ring. Lighting the gas jet... An old-fashioned fishtail burner, he held the thing to the light, but through its opacity could distinguish only a shapeless blur. Perhaps distance, either from the eyes or the object to be focused, would sharpen its outline. He experimented thus, standing at arm's length from the jet and gradually advancing the glass towards the flame. At really close quarters, it did seem to let through a little more light and he was so occupied with this discovery that he never thought of the effect which the accompanying heat might have on the glass, until a sharp snap, followed by a tinkle on the linoleum, informed him that he had cracked it. With a muttered expletive, the boy turned it over, and at once noticed an interesting fact. The glass appeared to be built up in layers, and the heat had split off a piece of the outer one, revealing a second and seemingly undamaged surface beneath. He pursed his lips in a whistle. The discovery might have some bearing on the apparent uselessness of the object. It was a natural conclusion that a perfect lens might be hidden under the dark covering, though the purpose of all the secrecy and mystery woven around glass and miniature was more than Peter could guess. He found his penknife, and carefully inserting it under the broken edge, split off another fragment. Once started, the remainder came away so easily that in a few minutes he had completely exposed the underlying surface, the layer on the other side flaking away with equal facility after a light wrap with the handle of the knife. The now transparent lens, tinted, as far as he could judge against the twilight with his back to the gas, a kind of smoky blue, possessed an astounding power of magnification when he tried it on the back of his hand. The hand, as such, in fact, completely disappeared, and the circle of glass showed only a portion of the skin enlarged to a degree which he would have thought only a microscope could achieve. As he watched, the enlarging process seemed to continue as though concentric rings of the tissue were rolling out from the centre and vanishing through the rim. He had a sickening sensation of being about to sink bodily into the glass, and hastily shutting his eyes, put it down on the table. A queer sensation passed off rapidly, but left him with a mixed feeling of giddiness, excitement and fear. There was something uncanny about the lens, damned uncanny, but his faults did not include cowardice, and he resolved to complete his experiments single-handed. With this decision, he proceeded to lock the door, and pulling the table as near as he could to the gas jet, sat down to test the effect of the lens on the miniature. The grey perpetual twilight had neither brightened nor darkened by one iota when Peter completed his seventh circuit of the mighty battlements. Dizzily far below him, the waves of an apparently tideless sea broke and hissed back along the same bank of shingle, neither advancing nor retiring, each followed by an interminable succession of troughs and crests, sweeping in from a vague horizon that seemed infinitely distant from the high eminence upon which he stood. But for their maddeningly regular beat, no sound whatever broke the silence. No breeze moved the cold and stagnant air, 
and throughout the gigantic mass of masonry he was the only thing that lived. Above him the sky was a leaden monotony, broken at one place alone by a mere pinpoint of light which appeared to be a far-off beacon. It shone where the diminishing thread of a titanic causeway merged into the skyline. Peter drew a clammy hand across his eyes and leaned wearily against the ramparts. Was he mad? Or had some unbelievable miracle literally transported him in a flash of time from his dingy back room to this far distant and eerie place? That he was not dreaming, his sore knuckles proved, where he had struck them hard against unyielding stone in the panic frenzy of his incredible translation. He said aloud, Oh God! in a meaningless sort of way, and repeated it several times, partly for the love of any sound other than that of the waves, and partly to focus his attention. Although he could not then have put it into words, the panorama, to his rather limited mind, accustomed to concrete surroundings, savoured alarmingly of the abstract. Resolutely directing his gaze at the nearest buttress of the ramparts, he went over in his mind, perhaps for the twentieth time, the series of his sensations from the moment when he had held the lens over the model. Through the glass, the tiny castle had appeared to grow and grow in swiftly overlapping rings from its centre. There had been a feeling of suction, as though he were being dragged violently towards it, and then a moment, or an hour, of complete blackout from which he had emerged to a realisation of standing in an immense copy of the miniature courtyard, looking up at the terrific mass of the keep. Appalled by its sickening height, and crushed by his own proportional sense of smallness, he had nevertheless been impelled to enter the open door, and climb endlessly up flight after flight of stone steps, till he came out weak and trembling on the roof. And then the feverish pacing of its periphery, a prey to wonder, fear, and a horrible giddiness each time he looked down towards the sea. And all the time the grey, unnatural twilight had persisted, tormenting him with the half-knowledge that he was not even on the earth at all, but in some incredible place, utterly divorced from all things human and alive. It was healthy, physical hunger that eventually restored his mental balance to something near normality. In whatever nightmare realm he had landed himself, it clearly contained no possible source of food, and he must find his way out before starvation overtook him. The castle was sea-girt, and the interminable causeway that stretched from the shore towards the horizon was the only apparent means of exit. He felt a trifle fortified at the prospect of escape, and eagerly began the long descent of the stairways. The glass, Mrs. Stebbings repeated defiantly, ain't here, and I ain't took it. Them bits in the earth might be it, broke, but that don't tell me where young hunters orped off to. She tossed her head, and him owing me a week's rent, she added with meaning. The police sergeant turned from his inspection of the broken lock and gave her an expressionless glance. That's all right, he replied. I'm not accusing you of taking it, but it certainly isn't in this room. No doubt Hunt has it with him. That's to say if there is a glass, as this writing states. Now, Mrs. S., he went on, pacifically, please see if your other lodger is in the house. We shall want him to confirm your account of breaking into this room. Not that we doubt your word, he added hastily, just as a matter of form. As the landlady's footsteps died away on the rickety stairs, he turned to the constable who accompanied him. Another mare's nest, I fancy, he remarked. Lodger owes week's rent, can't pay, so leaves quietly. Can't smuggle his stuff out, cause she's too sharp-eyed. Clothes aren't worth much, anyway. Hard on the lady, of course, but scarcely one of the cases where we call in the yard. He paused and looked thoughtfully around him. All the same, he continued. It is a bit queer how he got out with the door locked inside. The window's too big a drop, the roof's out of reach, and there are no marks on the key to show he turned it from outside with forceps. How long's he been missing? asked the constable. The sergeant consulted his watch. About forty-two hours. She saw him coming upstairs with a parcel. Probably this. He indicated the box and model on the table. 
about 5 p.m. on Saturday. Left him to sleep, as she supposed, all yesterday, and got the other fellow to break the lock when he didn't come down to breakfast this morning and she found the door fastened. Yes, it looks like a case of convenient disappearance, seeing that he's not turned up at his job. Well, she ought to get her rent and a bit over on the price of this miniature if he doesn't come back to claim it after a reasonable interval. But I doubt if she'll see Master Hunt again in this house, he concluded. For God's sake, water and food, said a hoarse, feeble voice behind them, and they swung round in amazement to see the missing lodger, pale and haggard, sprawled across the bed. That familiarity breeds contempt is a proverb of some antiquity, and more than a little justification. And although contempt was the last sentiment Peter Hunt felt with regard to lost keep, it was not long before his initial fear of the unknown was transmuted into a complacent acceptance of his heritage and of the supernatural powers it conveyed. His circumstances at the age of thirty differed vastly from those in which the arrival of the remarkable miniature had found him. He now possessed a house in Park Lane, a country seat down in Dorset, three cars, a large staff of servants for the upkeep of his establishments, and above all a very charming but neglected wife, among whose many contributions to his well-being was a son and heir, also named Peter, but generally known as Pete for purposes of distinction. It was in the library of his Park Lane mansion that Peter was sitting one August evening when a telephone call informed him that Lord Knifton proposed calling on him for a private interview in half an hour's time, and Peter's thin lips twisted into a grimace of satisfaction as he hung up the receiver. Knifton was his co-director in many of the big commercial enterprises from which his income was derived, and he had lately been behaving in a most obstructive way by refusing to approve certain conversion schemes which he, Peter, had evolved for their joint enrichment to the expense of the shareholders. He was one of the few financial magnates sufficiently powerful to interfere seriously with Peter's activities, and the time had come when one or the other must definitely take second place. Well, Knifton might indulge in whatever ideals he chose, but Peter knew which of them that one would be. He opened the drawer of his desk and took out the miniature fortress, the hard circle of the lens pressed comfortingly against his abdomen in the inner pocket where it always reposed. A thousand knifetons could not dominate the master of lost keep. With half an hour's leisure, Peter's thoughts wandered back to the day when he had discovered the trick of the model, and so nearly lost his life in the discovery. Even now he shuddered to recall that unending march along the rocky causeway, that seemed to lead on eternally towards an horizon that never grew a mile nearer. How that unchanging grey twilight had mocked him with its denial of time after he had dropped his watch into the sea, and had no means of counting the passage of the hours. The sullen waves had lapped on with changeless rhythm either side of him, raising and lowering their fringe of decaying weed with never a variation in the limit of their lift until he had screamed aloud at their inexorable monotony. <coughs> he remembered how he had tramped on, mile after mile, towards the ever-receding skyline, till sheer exhaustion had dropped him in his tracks, and how, as he fell, his hand doubled under him, had come in contact with the lens which he then recollected having slipped into his pocket, just as unconsciousness was claiming him in the Tilbury bedroom. With tired fingers he had drawn it out and held it, by some inner prompting, between his dim eyes and the distant beacon, to find himself, an instant later, lying across his bed with two policemen in the room and the tread of his landlady's feet ascending the stairs. Even then, with no formulated ideas of the value of his discovery, instinct had warned him to slip the lens again into his pocket, and to their excited queries about where he had been and the manner of his return he had reiterated foolishly that he had been asleep. They had given him water, that of the strange ocean had been too brackish to drink, and bread, which he had devoured wolfishly, but to all their questions he had answered, I don't know, I was asleep, until they finally left him, evidently much mystified, and whispering together.
It was during the ensuing night that, unable to sleep for thinking about the model fortress, he began to realise the almost unlimited possibilities it contained. In whatever uncharted spot the original was situated, he felt sure that its whereabouts remained undiscovered by man, and it followed logically that he would have unquestioned dominion there. True, there were no inhabitants upon whom to exercise it, but suppose he could find a way of transporting other people to the place. He had assured himself that the whole thing was not feverish delirium by making several more brief visits to the keep, always being careful to maintain a tight hold on the lens when the period of blackout arrived. Reference to the alarm clock by his bed showed him that, whatever might be the distance from the model to the real fortress, the transit occupied no measurable time at all, and this fact alone, should he choose to defy mankind, would provide a perfect alibi, since no jury would admit that he could travel hundreds, maybe thousands of miles in a fraction of a second. Any breach of law or convention would have to be carried out at the real place at a time when he was known to be at home, and this arrangement would safeguard him against its very discovery. He reverted to the problem of getting his victims, veritable slaves they would be, to the island of his sovereignty, and concluded that the lens was large enough for two people to look through it at once, if it were held at the right distance. Peter awoke from a half-dream and smiled at the model. To this day, he had never come an inch nearer to solving the location of Lost Keep itself, but the miniature had served him well, and he loved those early memories. How scornfully disbelieving his foreman had been when he had hinted at the acquisition of something with magical properties. It had required a lot of restraint and tact to persuade him round to the lodging house for a demonstration, after he had brusquely sacked Peter for failing to be at work on that memorable Monday. But Peter had feigned cheerful indifference, supporting his attitude with talk of a quite mythical better job waiting for him, and the mention of a bottle of whisky, bought out of his slender savings, had clinched the matter. After a few drinks, Peter had brought out the miniature, and inviting the foreman to sit beside him and concentrate upon it, had focused it with the lens. The usual enlargement of the image and the subsequent blackout had duly occurred, but this time, on coming to his senses in the great courtyard, he had seen beside him another figure. A figure with dropped jaw and blank eyes staring up at the colossal pile overhanging them. He had thereupon directed the lens at the beacon and translated himself back to Tilbury. Alone. It was only fair to himself, Peter always reflected at this point, to remember that he had been in ignorance of the man's alcoholic heart. He had intended only to punish him by leaving him marooned for a day, and it was with no little horror, for his autocratic power was still new, that he found him lying dead at the gateway on the following morning. Assurance of immunity, however, had gone far to overcome any remorse he had felt, and the six pounds odd which he had found in the man's pockets had consoled him in his unemployment. Those six pounds had in fact been the foundation of his present fortune, for from that chance windfall, the acquisition of other and larger sums had been a rational and easy step, and he had found that anything he carried on his person was translated with him on his journeys, between Lost Keep and the everyday world. Other advantages, too, were afforded by his unique possession. There had been, for instance, women who had denied him. On one thing Peter had always congratulated himself, he had never allowed any of his bond slaves to escape from Lost Keep. Once, indeed, he had been tempted to bring back a girl, for whom he had felt an unusually lasting passion, into the warm world of sunlight and blue skies. But he had realised in time the danger of having his secret betrayed, and had left her to pine in the cold grey twilight where none, it seemed, could survive more than a few months. He had taken her food and drink in plenty, for it had hurt him to visualise her in the agonies of starvation, but he had seen the lovely face grow wan, and eyes lose a spark more of their lustre on each successive visit, and at the end he had stayed away for many days rather than face more of her pleadings for release. Peter shook himself and glanced at the clock. Knifton was nearly due. He had been sitting, dreaming in his shirt sleeves, for the evening was oppressively hot, and now he rose and donned a heavy silk dressing gown that was hung over the back of his chair. It was a highly coloured affair, 
the fabric of which had been especially woven for him in a unique pattern of interlacing circles. Lord Knifton was a man some fifty years of age, who possessed both personality and tact. Though he frankly disagreed with many of Peter's principles, and never hesitated to tell him so when their joint affairs were involved, he had considerable respect for his business acumen, and liked him well enough socially. Thus it was that, on being shown into the library, he made no immediate attempt to introduce the subject of their recent dispute, but shook hands and accepted a cigar, while chatting of generalities. He soon noticed the model fortress and remarked upon its brilliant workmanship. Yes, Peter agreed, a marvellous example of miniature craft, but its wonders show up better when viewed through this glass. Just sit still and keep the model in focus. Don't look away, even if it makes your head swim for a second. There's no danger to the eyes, and you'll find the effect amazing. He leaned over the back of Lord Knifton's chair and held the lens so that both could see the fortress through it. And now, Knifton, he said stridently, I've got you just where I want you. His companion rubbed his eyes and looked about him in bewilderment. A moment ago, he had been sitting in Hunt's luxuriously furnished library on a hot August night, looking at the miniature on the desk. Now, by some miracle, he found himself in a gigantic stone-flagged court, high-walled, and fronted by a fortress of staggering dimensions, while, under a dead grey sky that cast no shadows, the windless air struck coldly through his thin evening suit. The stench of a charnel house assailed his nostrils, and he saw with revulsion that the ground was strewn with human remains in all stages of decomposition, from bare bleached skeletons to gory carcasses of the freshly slain and the less recently alive, hideously distended. He cried out sharply and recoiled several paces, slewing round with upraised arms as he collided with someone behind him. Only your host, said the voice of Peter Hunt, with a chilly suavity from which all trace of friendliness had vanished. Please make yourself quite at home. It is your home now, you know. That is, until you realise that I am bound to win in the end, and sign this concession you so smugly discountenanced yesterday. He produced an impressive-looking document, stiff with seals, and opened it with a flourish. Then, seeing that his guest remained tongue-tied, went on bitingly, framing a spate of questions, I suppose. What's this place? How did I get here? And so forth. Well, you may save your breath. Where you are, I know no better than you. What I do know is that I have been absolutely monarch of it for many years. Peter Hunt of Park Lane, pillar of society, political leader, supporter of the Constitution, deferring to the wishes of a dozen pettifogging public bodies, <laughs> and enjoying the farce, <laughs> because I know that I can at will take any man to whose opinion I pretend to bow, and bring him here, and rule him as you can rule a dog. He laughed unpleasantly. <laughs> You damned fool. Do you think it's for the money that I want your signature? I can get enough to pay the national debt by bringing the rich to lost keep and stripping them of their wealth. There's one in there, he muttered, as a despairing moan echoed from behind a barred grating in the stonework. He's trying to decide whether it's worthwhile to sign a cheque and write home to say how much he's enjoying his holiday in Portugal. No, my esteemed and scrupulous partner, one grows weary of ruling over subjects a few at a time in this gloomy place. I want to come out into the open and rule a country. And when this concession goes through, I can do it. At last, Lord Knifton spoke, and in his tones were neither fear nor anger, only an abiding sorrow. Peter Hunt, he replied solemnly by some diabolical means which I do not even wish to fathom, you wield a power that no man is ready to possess. I can only say, God, take that power from you before more evil is done. As he spoke, a swift shadow blotted out half the sky, 
and humped threw back his head in amazement. In the whole course of his association with this weird retreat, he had never known anything to break the canopy of twilight, and his hands fell nervelessly to his sides as there burst on his vision a mass of shining metal, so huge as almost to dwarf the keep, miraculously suspended in space above it. For a few seconds its great spatulate point hovered over the turrets. Then it darted down and rushed at them, its lower edge grinding and roaring along the paving stones. Uncle, you promised to show me your new microscope. May I see it now? Pete demanded with a sidelong glance at his mother. But it's bedtime, dear, said Lydia Hunt, and you can see Uncle Harry's reading. Run upstairs now like a good boy and you shall see it tomorrow. Pete dropped a pathetic lower lip. He was a sunny-natured child, though a trifle spoiled. Oh, but Uncle did promise. He said today, and I've been looking forward to it all school time. I told the other chaps in our form about it, and they'll want to hear what I've seen with it tomorrow. Won't you show me something tonight, please, Uncle Harry? Lydia's brother looked up from his evening paper with a whimsical smile. Well, he laughed. I promised to take it round to Dr. Prudence tomorrow to check over some of his cultures, so perhaps the boy had better see it tonight. Won't take long. All right, Pete. The mic's in Daddy's library, and I believe he's got Lord Knifton there with him, but we'll see if they'll let us have it. Pete clutched one of his hands with the enthusiasm of the ten-year-old and danced across the hall at his side. They came to the library door and knocked, but there was no reply. Pete pushed it open and looked in. Come on, Uncle Harry, he cried. They must have gone out. Where's the microscope? His uncle crossed over to a cupboard, lifted out something large and shiny, and stood it on the desk. It was an expensive instrument, covered with exciting little brass knobs, and Pete's eyes gleamed when they saw it. Coo, what a beauty, he exclaimed rapturously. Wish I had one. Oh, and look, Uncle, here's Daddy's model fortress. I've never seen it properly before. Can we look at that through the microscope? No, of course not, you silly kid. They're for examining very tiny things like grains of dust, and you have to put them between the glass plates so as to light them from behind. If you just stood the end of the barrel against a lump of solid stuff, you'd see nothing at all. Now then, here's a slide, he went on, handing the boy two little oblongs of glass. Just get a wee flake of dirt on the tip of that silver paper knife and park it between these. Then I'll show you how the world looks to an influenza germ. Pete giggled, and scraped up a speck of dust from the courtyard of the model fortress, wiped the knife on the slide, and obediently passed it across. His uncle fitted it into a frame at the lower end of the barrel, bent down to the eyepiece, and began manipulating the brass knobs. Pete watched him, fascinated, and chafed at the time it took to get the adjustment right. He was on the point of asking how soon he might be allowed to have a look when he heard his uncle give a low whistle. Pete he said, in a funny, unsteady voice, and without lifting his head from the eyepiece. Go and ask Mummy to come here, will you? And then hang on in the drawing room till we call you, there's a good chap. I've got something I want her to see first, and after that you shall have the microscope to yourself till you go to bed. Though crestfallen at this further delay, Pete understood from the tone that it was not the time to argue, and presently Mrs. Hunt had taken his place by the desk. Her brother rose, and gave her a searching glance. Take a look at that old girl, he suggested, indicating the microscope. Tell me if I'm dreaming. Lydia sat down in the chair. Why, Harry, she exclaimed. They're miniature skeletons, but how on earth can they be modelled so perfectly on such a scale? Her brother shook his head. Pete certainly scraped that bit of dust off the miniature, he answered. They are not models. Take a grip on yourself and shift the slide from right to left. This is the button that operates it. Lydia obeyed the instruction and then broke out again in a tone of astonishment. But it's unbelievable. A pygmy race no bigger than bacilli and shaped in the exact pattern of humans. Why? She added. There are even buckles and bits of cloth just like we wear. 
but they must be models. Move the slide a bit further, said Harry quietly, and then gripped her by the shoulders as she thrust her chair backwards from the desk with a cry of horror. Cheeks blanched and eyes dilated. Harry! Harry! she gasped. I can't bear it. It's Peter and Lord Knifton. That dressing gown. There's not another like it in the world. Oh, that horrible mess of blood and the limbs were were still twitching. What does it mean? Her brother poured some whiskey into a glass and held it to her lips. It means, I think, that there was truth in the legend of Lost Keep and that Peter found the key. It would account for his mysterious disappearances and other things. He concluded grimly. Lydia drained the tumbler and straightened up in the chair. You mean that the original castle really exists and that in some beastly fashion its happenings are mirrored in the model? Then tell me, Harry, how can we find the real place? There may still be life in them. We must send help. We must! Her brother sighed. <sighs> there is no journey to make. How such a thing can be, God knows, but that thing is Lost Keep. And there they are locked. Moltom in parvo. Ugh, it makes me sick. Suddenly, Lydia was galvanized into action. She began to turn out the drawers of the desk, scattering their contents on the carpet. The lens, Harry! The lens! She cried hysterically. We can go ourselves and find out. Harry took her gently by the arm. No, dear, he replied with finality. Peter has the lens. Today's story was Lost Keep by L. A. Lewis. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Come in, he said. Come into the light. Join me on Patreon for stories like this. Aye, he replied. The oldest show on earth. All about a murder and a hanging. It's queer how folks likes a murder, even if it's only old Punch knocking Judy's brains out with his stick. And stories like this. Beyond this are the private apartments, and I ask you all to remove your shoes. Then she smiled a little and added, or other footwear. And this. As I was getting up speed, I heard the pad of feet and a snarling behind me. The next moment, the heavy bulk of a big animal caught me broadside on and nearly unseated me. Show your support for the channel and join me on Patreon. Those who would prefer not to do so may sit on the seats and wait here. Read the video description for more information. If you enjoy the show, why not become a patron? on Patreon and gain access to exclusive content. It's the surest way to help me keep creating. You can also buy me a coffee, like, subscribe, comment, share, follow on social media, and read the description for more information about the show and how you can engage with it. Until next time, sweet dreams.